All right, welcome back, everybody. This is going to be a great hour because uh, right right in uh, the state of Montana, at least partially in the state of Montana, uh, we have Yellowstone National Park and deep, deep underground, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it could be something that uh, is a lot bigger than we ever anticipated. So, first of all, John King, you, you always get the greatest guest. So, well, could thanks. you introduce Lee for us? Yeah, please? Lee's a great guy to talk to. I spoke with him a couple weeks ago, did an interview with him. Uh, after we found some new information out about that volcano you just referenced. And uh, anyway, this guy's a really fascinating uh, guest. Uh, so Lee Siegel is a native of Portland, Oregon, senior science writer for the University of Utah Communications Department. Um, and I, and he's, he was kind of with this team of, of uh, volcanologists and other specialists that were looking at the volcano and studying the magma underneath. I'll let him explain the science in a second. But one of the things that ties into what we were talking about right before the the uh, Lee came on the air with this um, uh, is a little bit of his background. He studied at the University of Oregon, earned a master's degree at Columbia University School of Journalism in New York, and uh, directly tying in with what Peter was talking about, uh, the Mount St. Helens issue, um, he actually began his career with the newspaper in Washington State, uh, and this is back in 1976 to 1981, where he was a member of the staff of the Daily News of Longview, Washington, when the staff won its Pulitzer Prize for covering the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Very cool. So a long history of natural disasters and <laughs> science, and uh, welcome to our own local natural disaster, the Talkback Show. Lee. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, good morning. <laughs> so, so because we spout off every morning. Right. But, uh, well, that's uh, so, what talk shows are for. Yeah, you bet. Well, first of all, uh, th- thank you for agreeing to be with us today. And I think it, what, what's really interesting is that we here in Montana, uh, we're, we're basically if you will, on the edge of this thing, no matter where you are in Montana, it's going to be big enough if it does blow. Uh, it, but everybody in Montana is just kind of blasé about this deal. So <laughs> what what can you tell us about this caldera that we didn't know before? Well, the new study that came out in the journal Science a few weeks ago basically revealed the existence of a magma reservoir deeper than the magma chamber that we already knew about under Yellowstone. And um, the size of these things are pretty amazing. Over the years, the magma chamber, which is about three, starts at about three miles deep and goes down to about nine miles deep, the size of that's increased as the uh, seismologists' methods for making images underground have improved. So that over the last few years, they're, they had published a study. It actually got published last year, but it was uh, received several rounds of publicities where they publicity, excuse me, where they presented at science meetings, showed that the shallow man- magma chamber that we've known about for a long time was about two and a half big times bigger than we thought. Now, this new study is shown below the magma chamber at a depth of about 12 miles underground to 28 miles underground is this deeper magma reservoir that basically feeds the magma chamber, and it's sort of the missing link in the understanding of the, the plumbing of Yellowstone. We knew about the, the hot spot plume, which comes up from deep within Earth's mantle. We're not sure how deep. Some people think it goes all the way to the core of the Earth. Others don't think so. But we knew about that, and we knew about the shallow magma chamber. What we didn't know was sort of how the magma got from the plume up into the magma chamber, and now with better technology, they're able to see this magma reservoir. Now, one thing I want to say right off, because every time a study comes out about Yellowstone, there are there's a group of Yellowstone conspiracy theorists <laughs> who take every damn thing that happens at Yellowstone and try and make it sound like the thing's about to blow, which is utter nonsense. The um, supervolcano eruptions from Yellowstone, chance of one happening annually is about 1 in 700,000, the scientists say. So we're talking about an unimaginable disaster, but we're talking about an unimaginable disaster that happens on geologic time scales. Bob Smith, who's sort of the dean of uh, Yellowstone research here at the University of Utah and is one of the main members of the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, he points out that you're much more likely in the region up around the Yellowstone and the Tetons to get killed in an earthquake than 
from a supervolcano eruption just because earthquakes are much more common. Since quake swarms, of course, happen all the time at Yellowstone. Big quakes aren't that often, but, you know, the last real disaster up there was the Hebgen Lake quake in, uh, I believe it was 1959, that right. killed more than two dozen people. Uh, w- w- since we're on the uh, the topic of earth tectonics and volcanoes, uh, there was uh, some of uh, the, the conspiracy stuff you were talking about earlier, going around the internet not long ago, showing video of animals running. Buffalo, buffalo yeah. running And I, I called the Yellowstone Park. They were actually <laughs> running into the park. The oh, opposite got, direction. Yeah, I heard they were, act- I, I don't have first-hand knowledge, but I was told by the scientists that they were running into the park, not out of the park. Somebody so, dropped a bag of fries on the highway. The <laughs> melting roads. Where was it? On Firehole Lake Drive? I right, yeah, right, last yeah. summer. Now, the melting roads are real. Well, they're real, but that doesn't mean a super volcano is going to happen. It means right. there's hot springs and other ge- geothermal activity very shallow in that area, and that's what makes the road melt. It doesn't mean, you know, the super volcano is about to blow by tell, any means. Tell you what, Lee, we're up against a break, but what I want to ask you about is, is Yellowstone Park, uh, with its thermal features, is I want to know if this is completely unique in all the world. In other words, if this is the only place just like Yellowstone anywhere on the planet, I'm sure you probably know. I, I would like to know myself. 721-1290, if you have a, a question for Lee, uh, he'll be on with us till 10. Give us a call, 721-1290 or 1-800-568-5309. I want you to know I did my research oh, really? into this topic. Uh-huh. Very scholarly research. I went directly to YouTube and found the Super Volcano TV movie that came out about six or seven years ago, and I watched it I'm twice. Sure it was absolutely accurate. Oh, absolutely! But it had great graphics and good special effects. Yeah. And I just watched Godzilla. <laughs> we're going to come right back with more in a moment. <laughs> All right, we're back on Talkback seven two one twelve ninety. Is our guest Lee Siegel's joining us? Uh, 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 on the phone, he said, now, I, I'm assuming you're in you're in Utah right now? Yeah, I'm in Salt Lake City. Okay, now, let, let me ask you this. Is Yellowstone and its features, is it completely unique in all the world? No. Um, I, it, I'm not sure if it is the biggest or second or third biggest in terms of super volcanoes. I'm not really familiar with that. I know there are other super volcanoes in the world. I think Yellowstone may be the biggest, but I won't swear to that. Uh, there are other places with a lot of geothermal features, the hot springs and geysers, I believe someplace in far eastern Russia, but I'm not completely familiar. There's mm-hmm. another big caldera that's quite famous in Italy, the Campi, and I'm going to mispronounce it, Campi Flagre or Flagri Volcano, which is the same thing as Yellowstone. It huffs and puffs. There's times where the ground goes up for a few years, and then it sinks and it goes up. This can happen for long periods of time before there's actually an eruption. Okay, I, I have a question for you, and it's not a conspiracy question. <laughs> That's fine. I, I'll take all I, I know, I know that there's this sense of disbelief that we have to have as humanity that this could happen in our lifetimes. But this particular volcano has erupted in the past, right? Mm-hmm. And seems to go off at a fairly regular interval. And a lot of people think that that interval time is up and that it could go in any day. And there's and also an argument. I mean, I've heard that argument. There's also the argument that as, you know, the Yellowstone isn't the only place eruptions from the Yellowstone hotspot happened for 17 million. Well, let me put it this way. 17 million years ago, the hotspot was under what is now the basically border between Nevada, Oregon, and Idaho. And as the North American plate of Earth's crust and upper mantle drifted southwest, the Yellowstone hotspot effectively moved northeast. I, excuse me, I'm sorry, the plate moved southwest, the hotspot northeast, and basically it erupted more than 140 times in supervolcano eruptions over the last 17 million years as basically Idaho, Idaho slid over it which is the reason you have this vast, flat expanse called the Snake River Plain these days. There were just dozens and dozens of eruptions, and only two million years ago did the hotspot reach Yellowstone, have these three big eruptions in that time. And there is an argument that now the hotspot is under getting toward being under the hot, uh, excuse me, colder, thicker part of the continent, namely the Rocky Mountains, and that it might not ever be able to erupt again. That's the counter-argument. 
Okay. okay. They I'm not up. taking sides. Yeah, sure. I'm just saying that there's two ways you can look at it. So well, there's two ways. One of them were dead. <laughs> no, one of them, somebody probably tens of thousands of years from now is yeah, dead. Yeah, okay. Let's right. let, let's get to the phone and say good morning to Catherine. Catherine, you're on with... Uh, go ahead, with Lee. Morning, uh, Catherine. Yeah, good morning. I just... Uh, you kind of alluded to the uh, one question that I was going to ask about plate tectonics and how that intersects with uh, volcanoes. And if there was a massive earthquake, um, how how much would it affect the possible eruption of Yellowstone? The second one is if it exploded, how would it compare to, to the Krakatoa eruption? Let me take the second one first. I'm not sure. I believe it would be bigger and probably worse. Okay. It would have, you know, definitely global climate effects. A good part of the United States would be in big trouble. Now, in in, in my scholarly research, Lee, <laughs> when, I, right. when I watch Super Volcano... <laughs> I know, but I had popcorn. So anyway, mm-hmm. um, the the uh, the image, the graphic that the guy showed the the gal from FEMA was that the the various levels of destruction, starting with A, B, C, D, and E, mm-hmm. is starting close and then hitting farther out. Uh, basically, got all the way to the east coast and all the way down to the Gulf Coast and all the way across. So right. basically, the entire United States and part of Canada would be uh, very, very negatively affected by this right. volcano. I mean, you guys would be toast, basically. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Salt Lake, I believe. Uh, let me just talk about what I know about the, the prehistoric eruptions. Okay. Salt Lake was covered with, I think, five or six inches of ash. So much ash blew south and east that the Mississippi River was completely clogged with wow. ash. Wow. Um, it would, if it happened today, shipping would become impossible on the Mississippi until the most massive dredging job in history of humanity was probably pulled off. Um, there's a place in Nebraska, I'm forgetting the exact name, but a state park in Nebraska that has fossil horses, camels, I'm not sure what all else lived at the time, buried in multiple feet of ash. They were basically in low areas with hills around them. And when the ash blew in, it wasn't that thick everywhere, but the way it blew into these depressions literally buried these animals, and now it's a state park for these fossil wow. animals. That's in Nebraska. Now, Catherine, you had you had another question for yeah. Me, what right? was your other one? Oh, it was about uh, plate tectonics and how likely or how much does it increase the possibility if we had a massive earthquake in the right? Whether an earthquake would trigger the eruption? Well, trigger or increase the possibility of I don't uh, an eruption occurring. I, I mean, I think more likely is that Thanks, if Catherine. there was an eruption going to happen, it would trigger a lot more seismic activity. I don't think the earthquakes have the same anywhere near, I may be wrong about this, but have anywhere near the energy that, you know, a massive eruption would have. So I would think more that if an eruption was going to happen, that you would see increases in seismic activity. I'm not a scientist, so I don't know the details, but I know, for example, at Mount St. Helens, which is a much smaller and different kind of volcano, there was what's called harmonic tremor, and they learned that harmonic tremor is a certain kind of seismic activity that precedes a lot of volcanic eruptions. But I don't really think an earthquake in itself, even a big one, would be capable of triggering an eruption. I think it would be more likely the other way around. Okay, we're up against a break, and so, Carl, we're going to get your call on. We also have one line open, visiting with Lee Siegel. He's a, a, vul- a vulcanologist? No, no, no. He's a senior science writer for University of Utah. Oh, senior science writer. My apologies. Thank you, okay. Lee. All right, we're going to come right back and uh, continue this discussion. He probably still likes Star Trek, though. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. And hey, we're back on Talk Back. Seven two one twelve ninety, and uh, to my friend JJ, who years ago we scammed into thinking that there was a guy underneath Old Faithful <laughs> turning a valve once an hour, and uh, we had her going on that for yeah, quite a while. It's but. totally true, JJ. <laughs> Don't believe what Peter's telling you now. <laughs> Lee Siegel's joining us right now, and a science writer, and we're, we're talking about the caldera, uh, and, and and what I understand from my again from my scholarly research, uh, uh, Lee. That, that, that stands for cauldron, right? It's a big cauldron full of uh, magma, right? Um, you know what? I'm not really sure the derivation of the word. It sounds reasonable, but I will admit I do not know. Well, do, 
Real hey. quick, is there a name for it other than the caldera? No, basically I mean, there's three calderas, you know, one from each of the eruptions. One's over centered on Island Park in Idaho, and then the the older one and the newest one are basically overlapping in the heart of Yellowstone now. And uh, then we could name it. I think that, that you owe this to both <laughs> the, the writing community and news journalism as well. If we're going to call some sissy storm Sandy or whatever it might be, we need to do, you know get a cool badass name for this right. volcano like Hrothgar or, <laughs> or something. Fred. <laughs> Fred. Volcano Fred. Is... Volcano Fred. Hey, oh boy. let me, before you take another call, clarify yeah. one thing I didn't mention. Okay. You talk about magma chamber reservoir, people think molten rock. It's not true. It's partly molten. This new study showed that the, uh, the magma chamber that's right beneath the surface, three to nine miles, is about 9% molten rock. And this new magma reservoir, which is four and a half times bigger, basically would fill the Grand Canyon more than 11 times. The magma, that's only 2% molten. What a magma chamber reservoir is, is you've got to imagine like a sponge in your kitchen that's sort of wet. Most of the sponge is solid, but there's some water in the little holes in the sponge. That's what the magma chamber and reservoir are like. Mostly so, hot, solid, but with molten rock sort of in it like a sponge. Now, can you explain one thing to me? Because it's something I don't really understand. Like, Is this chamber kind of like constantly getting filled or slowly being filled with new magma from the depths of the earth, and eventually it'll reach a point where it doesn't have any more room, and it'll just go ba boom. Or, or is it different than what I just said? Is, is there an ebb and flow? This is what you get for having a writer, not a scientist, on. I'm not <laughs> sure, but it's slow. I can tell you that. Before the discovery of the new magma reservoir, what they thought was basically you had the head of the plume, and then bits of magma slowly ooze their way up and again it's like hot plastic not liquid and move through what are called dikes which are vertical cracks in the rock and would reach the magma re uh, chamber now we know that that's what happens you know we think these kind of cracks transport magma slowly from the head of the hot spot plume into this newly discovered magma reservoir and then from the top of that magma slowly seeps up through cracks into the shallower magma chamber. But again, if you think of this magma, it's not liquid. It's like a hot, malleable, or plastic substance moving very slowly. Okay, mm -hmm. let's, get, let's get Carl on the line. Carl, you're on with Lee. Go ahead. I have Carl. a question. I know uh, we're pretty well liked everywhere. This will probably never happen. But let's say somebody wanted to do as much harm to the United States as they could. They want to get the most bang for their buck. If they hit Yellowstone with a nuclear weapon, would that cause it to go off? I doubt it. I'm no expert, but the energy in a something like that super volcano makes the nuclear weapon look pretty puny, I think. And okay. um, I don't think Thanks, that would be able to trigger an eruption, no. Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's something I've seen floated around the Internet yeah, as well. Some one of the many conspiracy theories going around. Well, I mean, I, I have no doubt there's people out there that want to kill us by whatever novel means they can come up with. But, right. There would uh, be easier ways <laughs> than trying to trigger a super volcano. <laughs> now, now if, you, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you wouldn't mind for the next minute or so, <laughs> and, and again, I'm, I'm the disaster movie freak here, uh, if, if the worst were, were to happen and this caldera were to become a super volcano, what exactly would happen? Because, see, when you think of a traditional volcano with a mountain with a cone and it's smoking and then it, and pretty soon, boom, off it goes, th there's no cone. There's no mountain here. Well, the caldera is basically the crater. It's just a heck of a lot bigger than the crater, say, at Mount St. Helens. Okay. When that thing blew away, and I mean, there it blew off, what, the top couple thousand feet of the mountain. Right, right. And left this big crater. Uh, caldera eruptions, when they happen, you basically started getting eruptions. You know, imagine it as a big circle or crater. Eruptions start happening at various places around the edges of the crater, and eventually the whole floor of the caldera collapses inward, and then everything blows out. Now, I mentioned, I haven't extensively studied what the effects would be, but I've seen maps showing about two-thirds of North America 
covered with ash to some extent by the biggest eruption of Yellowstone, which put out about 2,500 times as much ash as the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption. There's no doubt that a large part of the Intermountain West would be, I mean, a good part, I, I don't know what the distance is, but for, I'm sure, at least 100 miles around Yellowstone, it would be pretty much total devastation. Um, I'm not sure exactly where the boundaries are. I, I've seen that, you know, Salt Lake, for example, got about five or six inches of ash, which, I mean, imagine that in a modern city. When, when St. Helens happened, if you're, if you're old enough like me to recall, um, you know, there were a lot of cities in eastern Washington that came to a halt for a while until they could get the ash off of everything. And, when, uh, when, when Mount St. Helens happened here, uh, I, and I pers- have personal experience with this, this was a totally new experience for everybody. And I'm talking police, fire, doctors. Right. Every, I mean, nobody knew what to do because this ash was falling on, on, on your house and on your car. People and, were putting pantyhose on car carburetors. Yeah, back exactly. Then. And, 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 so, and, and the question was, well, do we wash it off? And some would say, no, don't add liquid to it. It'll turn to cement and da-da-da-da. And so I said, well, do we brush it off? Do we wash it off? Do we use a power sprayer? What do we do? And so we had doctors on and engineers and all this kind of stuff saying, here's what you should do. Here's what you shouldn't do. And it was an amazing amalgam of, I don't know. <laughs> now, thanks to supermassive forest fires, we get to deal with that every year. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> this is the kind of disaster that happens so infrequently, it's... Uh you know, pretty hard for humans to contemplate what it would be like. You bet. Mm-hmm. Tell you but, what, we're, um, we're up again. You know, in some areas there'd be so much ash that, you know, everything would have to start over close yeah. in. I, uh, hold, hold on, Lee. We have to take a break. Uh, we'll be right back. Time to give away some coffee. We've been talking about really hot stuff, and uh, <laughs> I think it's appropriate that now we give away some hot coffee. You bet. This is fully liquid. There is no spongy molten no. Uh, magma in here. It's just coffee. And toast with your choice of spread. We're giving it away uh, courtesy of the Garden City Garden Supply. All you have to do is call our number, which is 721-1290. Don't have to answer any questions on volcanology. All you have to do is call 721-1290. Here we go. And we're back on TalkBack. 721-1290 is our number. 1-800-568-5309. Lee Siegel's joining us on the phone talking about the caldera beneath the Yellowstone Park. And Bruce has been waiting very patiently all the way through the break. By the way, congratulations to Sean. Yep, Sean's our coffee winner today. Good job. Bruce, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Uh, interesting topic. I'm just going to say that when I was up in Kalispell, when St. Helens blew, we had, I think, about four inches of ash. And... Uh, what I have read about the super volcano down there, Fred, um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's 600 mile radius kill zone around it. So it would be 300 miles north to the south, to the east, and the west. And what I think the ash would be uh, least of our worries because we get the pyroclastic flows. Possibly so. So what do you Which, think, Lee? Um,. I don't know where, I've seen the different numbers for what the kill zone would be. What you just mentioned doesn't sound unreasonable, but I'm not sure. Um, it certainly would not be good news for 300 miles in either direction. Well, you, would, you wouldn't be able to have any livestock or grow any crops. Yeah. Or, no, no, or, I'm all, I'm, Bruce, do you know offhand the, the pyroclastic flows, you know, those happened on like St. Helens. Does the Yellowstone, do you know if the Yellowstone kind of eruption actually produces pyroclastic flows? I'm, I'm assuming it would fairly, at least within a, you know, dozens of miles. Yeah, a lot of the, uh, the volcanics and stuff that I've seen, I get out in Rockhound a lot, and uh, there's lots of basalts and andesites and stuff, but there's lots of uh, old pyroclastic flows, too, with the volcanism. I don't know, that was so long ago, I don't know if it would be the same now. But I can't imagine things down there change that much. Yeah, well, I do know that, you know, deeper under Yellowstone, the rock's more basaltic. And, you know, as it comes up and when it actually erupts, it's what they call rhyolitic, which is the more lightweight kind of ash. But um, um, so I think pyroclastic flows near near the supervolcano are probably likely, but I'm, I'm not absolutely okay, sure. Okay, real quick, for those of us that are stupid out here, uh, when we use the term pyroclastic oh, flows. Sorry. Are that's we talking about me. like the slow moving red liquid that we see no, coming out of the No, that's lava. That's, that's just lava. lava. Yeah. Pyroclastic okay. flows are much different 
you know, you see the lava flow, say, coming down and from Kilauea in Hawaii okay. that's threatening that town. They're very slow and... Um, you know, they may be unstoppable, but they're they're slow. Yeah, you can, you Higher can, class yeah. flow is this mix, explosive mix of hot rock, ash, gas that just speeds down the mountainside with the eruption at some incredible speed and pretty much wipes out everything. And, and that, that's what killed all the people in Pompeii, was the pyroclastic cloud. They just hit them without even really even knowing what was going on. Hmm. So... Yeah, I, I don't know about Pompeii. Peter how much it would know he was there. Much ash, but they certainly got it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks for the call, Bruce. Appreciate it. All right. Seven, oh, oh, let's see. We have Craig. Oh, we lost Craig. All right. 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. Talking with Lee Siegel and... It's Craig on line three. Okay. All right. Craig, good morning. You're on Talkback. Go ahead. Were you caught in a pyroclastic I flow, Craig? Stop. Talk. Let's see. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. You're, you're on. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, a friend and I were in Missoula roofing, and uh, you know, we seen little specks of stuff starting to hit the roof and getting thicker and thicker, and we just dumbfounded. Anyways, we looked down the valley here, and it was just black, and there was just this black cloud rolling down the valley and everything. And the most interesting thing is, is we had the radio on and everything and never heard a word about this thing. So, anyways, we locked it up. And we had a drought that year, too, and things were looking pretty dismal for us. And after that, I don't know if that damn thing didn't seed the clouds or what, but it rained and all that ash was so rich and everything, everything just turned beautiful green. Anyway, that's Craigie's little story. All right, Craig, thanks for the call. So, thanks. what do you think, Lee? Um, think of a thousand to twenty five hundred times more ash if it were Yellowstone versus Mount St. Helens right. and much closer to his location. Yeah. Wow. So like the, the weight would almost crush you. Yeah. And and with that we're 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 up against a break. So Patty, if you'll hang on just a second, we have uh, one line open, seven to one uh twelve ninety. Lee Siegel's joining us. Talking about the caldera, the if you will, the potential volcano that exists underneath the Yellowstone Park. We'll Known be right as back. Fred. What's that? Known as Fred now. Yeah, Fred. Fred the Volcano. The Volcano of Fred. It doesn't sound very imposing. No. I, I still like Hrothgar. <laughs> hey, it's a Tuesday on a Talk Back, and uh, joining us on the telephone is Lee Siegel. He's with us from Salt Lake City, and we have a couple of Facebook We've comments. We've got two quick Facebook comments. Uh, one is from Ray. He wants to know if we can tap into Fred or Hrothgar <laughs> for uh, an energy source. I have never heard that proposed. That doesn't mean it hasn't been, but I mean, the biggest problem is you can't have industrial development in a national park. So I would assume that anything in Yellowstone could not be developed. What? You've never heard? You've never heard of sideways drilling? (laughs) Yeah, I have, but again, under a national park, I don't know what the rules are, but... I'd be dubious. Well. Plus, it's a volcano. There's already an evil mastermind that lives in there. Uh, another question, <laughs> this one's from Katie. Uh, she says, hypothetically, would a caldera eruption trigger a chain reaction of eruptions around the Pacific Ring of Fire? I doubt it, because I don't think that's happened in past eruptions. Like I mentioned earlier, there have been about 140 or more supervolcano eruptions from the uh, Oregon-Idaho-Nevada border up through the uh, Snake River Plain in Idaho, finally at Yellowstone in the last two million years. And, of course, we weren't around, but I'm not aware of any evidence that um, a volcanic eruption in one area would trigger something in another. Hmm. I will say that for years and years, scientists did not think earthquakes in one area could trigger earthquakes in another, and then we found out that wasn't in the last decade or so. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a study done here years ago about how there was a big earthquake up in Alaska and how it actually triggered um, some smaller earthquakes in Yellowstone. Uh, I think the theory was that it was jarring loose things in the hydrothermal system that were causing very shallow quakes related to the hot water. But um, we now know that quakes... And big quakes in one part of the world can trigger 
earthquakes elsewhere. But as far as volcanoes, I don't think so. Okay. Well, if it does happen, we won't be around to say, I told yeah, you so. Really, really. Right. So <laughs> let's, let, let's get Patty on the line. Patty, good morning. You're on with Lee Siegel. Go ahead. Uh, don't be so sure you won't be around. And basic physics, for every action, there's a reaction. What I wanted to say is I remember Mount St. Helens, and it would shut a motor down. And what I did, I had babies. So what I did is I took a spray bottle with water, and I happened to have basic gauge I put in it, and I kept spraying the air to settle the dust and then vacuum it up. And I also took the vacuum and ran the hose into the basement to pull clean air up into the house, and everybody that came in said, this is the freshest, you know, air that we've smelled because it was so bad. But let's hope that Fred doesn't go off. We don't need it. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks, Patty. Yeah. Why, wow. why is everyone buying Fred? Fred is good. Is Hrothgar just too hard to say? Because the H and the R, two consonants together. Fred's just more down to earth. I guess so. Gee, <laughs> Fred is Fred is a much more approachable <laughs> volcano. <laughs> A much more friendly sounding volcano. So, I think Yellowstone's pretty good just by itself. But. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Yellowstone. But, but say Yellowstone's, but everything's named Yellowstone down there. So <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> let's uh, let's get another caller on the line. And I believe it is going to be eventually when they get put on hold. There we go. Okay, Mike, you're on with Lee. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I, listening to this, I will tell you, and this is past history, and we can pretty well know what's going to happen if this blows up, uh, which I... What's with it will really ruin Al Gore's day because global warming will cease to exist for several years later because the you know years of no winter, no summer, summer was after Krakatoa blew right. up and after the uh, Alaska blew up where we now have the valley of ten thousand smokes lowered the temperature worldwide all over the place. The other thing that we know will definitely happen and we've seen this with some Mount St Helens. We have a baby boom nine months later. <laughs> and, I, and I was in Alaska at the time, and, I, and the woman who was always listening on the, on the phone call with the wife, and I told her, this is one time I wish was an obstetrician, because you will get rich in nine months from now. And the woman <laughs> finally hung the phone up. She decides you don't want to listen. Well, there's nothing else to do, so what the heck? Yeah, it well, I don't happens know. after every, every, any kind of an emergency like that. It, it happens. It always in, the blackout in New York City <laughs> produced the same thing. Exactly. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so <laughs> I guess that's one side effect. Yeah. If, 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 let's put it this way: if you're alive to enjoy it, then uh, <laughs> all right. So we have we have G. Anderson. We do. Uh, I have a bunch of Facebook questions as well. Okay, so let's let, read a few of these. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kitty says, "So where is Al Gore? The thermals must give off excessive heat. Global warming? Question mark. What will this do to La Nina or El Nino weather systems as they uh, need to release steam out into the atmosphere? By the way, I'm also a University of Utah graduate. Aha. So. Uh-huh. I-, I had a little trouble hearing all the questions. Uh, uh, I think it was mostly jokes about Al Gore. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, I think she does have a, a, There's a no really question, interesting... There's no question, though, that big volcanic eruptions affect climate globally. Krakatoa, Toba, you know, I believe St. Helens even had some effects... Uh, I think you get increased sulfur dioxide in the air, that um, Pinatubo in the Philippines, which was about 10 times bigger than St. Helens, had some climate effects. Yeah, there were, I forget if it was Krakatoa or Toba, but, you know, there was the uh, um, year with no summer, basically. Well, remember the one in Iceland that uh, basically shut down uh, air, air traffic in right. Europe for weeks. Oh, yeah, right. because yeah, it's right in the wrong place for the air traffic right. routes. Right. Now, now... What would happen, though? So all this, let's just assume, uh, I know what I'm talking about. All this ash goes in the air, right? Blocks the sun for a, at least a while. Does it cause global cooling and then long-term global warming because there's all this extra carbon? It certainly, in and I don't know if it's the ash or different gases that actually do it or both, but you do have global cooling for some period of, I mean, we're talking relatively short term, I believe, a matter of a few years or something after a massive eruption. Um, how that would tie into global warming that we're experiencing today, I don't know. I don't, you know, I mean, if it were a super volcano eruption well, let's, let's just that say wiped that, out a large area, that yeah. would certainly reduce future carbon emissions. Let, let, let's, let's just say that Fred never signed the Kyoto Protocols. <laughs> that way. So we're, we're, we're going to take one, we have a one minute break. G. Anderson, we'll get your, your call on in one minute. We have one line open. Lee Siegel stays with us for another eight minutes or so for the top of the hour. Stay with us.
And we're back on Talk Back. Uh, just a few minutes left in the show, and uh, Lee Siegel's joining us uh, from Salt Lake City. Let's get G. Anderson on here, and uh, you've been waiting very patiently. G., what's up, sir? Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Question for you. Uh, FEMA has has anticipated almost have anything that could happen. And I would assume, because it is FEMA, that they have hundreds of warehouses throughout the nation full of toilet paper. <laughs> what, what has FEMA done, actually done, in preparation for a, a, uh, a uh, catastrophe of this type? All right, well, let's... And I'll get off the line. Okay, thanks so much. So, so have, has, is that I anything? I frankly to... don't know. I have yeah. no connection to FEMA or know what the federal plans are, but I can tell you that disaster this magnitude would be pretty much unprecedented if it ever happened. Well, do you remember? Do, do you remember who, uh, Peter Markellis? Remember Peter Margella? Yeah, was on the, with us. He, he he is a disaster preparedness specialist. Yeah, I remember that. Guy. And and the one thing that he said is that the the United States government is woefully inadequate when it comes to planning for any disaster, even a short-term, like, couple days disaster. They haven't even predicted the asteroid that's going to hit this afternoon to wipe <laughs> us all out. I mean, I don't think they've even planned for it. Uh, we do have a uh, question from Jim, or a comment. He says, for names for the caldera, I vote for Trogdor the Burninator, which is a Homestar Runner reference that uh, Jim deserves accolades for. Uh, I, I, I'm with you, Jim. That would be an appropriate name. Trogdor the Burninator is a, is a great volcano name. <laughs> Trogdor the Burninator? Yeah. It's, <laughs> so, oh, Lord. Well, we, a little we, bit of a flashback we can, for we, can, we can laugh and joke about it, but <laughs> until it happens, until somebody, until somebody gets hurt, yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to get oh. into before Lee has to leave us, which is soon. By five minutes. Um, what I wanted you to kind of explain the science of how they found all this new, the new magma chamber oh, yeah. and all this stuff, because I think it's, it's fascinating. And if, if I'm not mistaken, you had to have earthquakes that happened not yes, too long ago um, in order as, to do it. As you know, earthquakes are very common around Yellowstone and the Tetons, uh, as they are around any kind of, you know, volcanic caldera. And, um, <clears throat> um, what the... Imagine you go to the hospital and get a MRI scan. They do basically, or a CAT scan, <clears throat> they do the same thing with the Earth, except instead of using mag a magnetic field like in an MRI or X-rays in a CAT scan, the seismic waves from earthquakes basically act like the X-rays. They travel through rock at different speeds depending on how hot or cold the rock is. So when the rock is hotter, the seismic waves slow down, and that means, you know, hotter rock is there. So they can draw a picture by the speed. They get thousands of earthquakes, and all these, you know, lines, the waves have traveled through the earth and are able to make an image using the earthquake waves of the underground area, just like a CAT scan uses x-rays to make a picture inside your body. Now, what was new in this study is a lot of the previous studies had looked either very deep at the plume or shallow at the existing pre-existing magma chamber. These guys combined two kinds of earthquake data, several thousand earthquakes from in and around Yellowstone, the Tetons, you know, this region from the University of Utah's seismic network up there. But then, and that's good for looking relatively shallow, but then they used what's called EarthScope, which was this array of portable seismometers that scientists moved from the West Coast to the East Coast over the last decade or so. Hmm. Big project to make a picture of the, basically the underground of North America. So some of the earthquake waves were from that, and the combination of the two is what allowed them to get the resolution, or in English, to see enough detail to make an image of this new magma reservoir. Wow. Now, um, I wanted to tell our listeners, if you go to our Facebook page for today, or if you go look up my old story uh, with Lee, there's a link, the first one, University of Utah, and you can go and see a picture that they've drawn up of what they believe the magma chamber looks like. My question, final probably one. Two minutes. Uh, is, you know, uh, Socrates famously said, you know, it, um, you know, the wise person is they that, that know that they don't know. And I, I want to know, 
when we look at this magma chamber and the new study and the evidence that we have, is it possible that it's even bigger, or is this a complete picture of how large this thing is? I, the way the scientists put it in the study, which was published in Science, which is you know, probably the premier science journal in the U.S., and they don't just publish anything. Um, I'm sorry, restate the question. Yeah, so is it, possible, is it possible that this is even bigger? Oh, uh, you or, know... Or do we have a I, pretty complete I, picture? They say they've seen now basically the complete, complete plumbing system from the plume to the surface, but I'm sure they'll come up with better and better detail as time and tech goes on and technology. Well, how much bigger could it be if it goes down to the center of the Earth, for crying Well, out they out. don't know. That's one big question. We don't know how... We've seen the plume only down to a depth of about, I think, six hundred or so, maybe seven hundred miles. Jeez. And the core <laughs> mantle boundary is eighteen hundred miles. Oh, okay. Well. So we don't know if this is originating with hot rock at the core or not. There's been a big debate whether it's that or whether it's just this shallower convection with the mantle sort of moving like a boiling pot of tomato soup. <laughs> and um so how deep the hot spot plume originates is still a matter of uh we don't know. Are there, there any dinosaurs down there? <laughs> uh, I think they would have been cooked a while ago. I think so, yeah. yeah. They're, they're well done by now. Hey, listen, Lee, we're completely out of time. I want to say thank you for, for spending uh, this hour with us. This has been highly informative and, and at least on our side, pretty ridiculous. But, uh, but we, we appreciate your common sense and the way that you've done the research, and we appreciate you being with us. Well, it's been fun. I appreciate it. And the only message I can say is if you, know, you want to worry about a disaster... Think about the people in the middle of the country getting walloped by tornadoes this week. You got it. Yellowstone yeah. is so infrequent compared to the disasters that happen every year in this country. You bet. That it's not really worth worrying about it. Lee, Lee thanks so much for being with us. What's going on tomorrow's show? Uh, tomorrow we'll have uh, World Affairs Council, two political science professors from the University of Montana. Have a great day, everybody.